Imagine an elder man getting a young girl in a situation where he owes someone a blood debt, and he wants to marry her despite her objections. He technically has the right, but it's not ideal for the girl to be his old wife among others. Or maybe he decides to give her away to a man from a faraway village, and she tries to escape. She could go to a neighboring village where they're not friends, and they wouldn't refuse her. They would make her part of their community and call her a village wife which means all the men there would have to take care of her. In many African cultures, older men usually have more than one wife, which means there are fewer women for the younger men to marry. This creates a lot of tension because it's not an equal situation. The concept of the village wife is one way societies cope with this imbalance and maintain some level of social order. In the village, young men who were not married often wanted the wives of older men. They would often try to win the affection of these women, and if a man didn't try to do so, others would tease him. The older men, because they wanted to have more than one wife, called polygyny, found it important to keep peace. To solve the problem, Lele, a leader, came up with a plan. When these young men reached about 18 years old, they were given the chance to buy the right to share a common wife. This way, the older men's wives would be distributed and the men's desires would be somewhat managed without causing too much chaos in the village. When a person pays a small amount in raffia cloth to the community, they can build a shared house. They might then either get a wife from the village to live together or join a group that tries to take one from another place. If someone without a home comes, the community will often let them join and have a place. In the village, there's a special kind of wife called a village wife. This is a respected position. When a new wife joins, she is treated like a princess. She doesn't do regular work like gardening or fetching water. Her young husbands do all those chores for her. They hunt for good food and bring her special treats to make her happy. She can use things from others, but she must be playful and mischievous, and everyone around her finds it okay. But here's something interesting. This village wife is also expected to share her love with older men from her age group. They can ask for her love at any time. At first, she might have to be with 10 or 12 men. This is a unique part of their tradition. In a village, a wife might have more than one husband, but eventually, she'd usually choose just one. They had a flexible way of living together. Yet, they were connected to the whole village. Her kids became the village's children too because they believed the village was like their real father, taking care of them and making sure they'd have a good marriage someday. To do this, villages needed to save things like raffia and camwood bars and big shared treasuries. That way, when they had kids, they could settle debts using these items, and even borrow if needed. Since there would be many kids and families in the village, they could both ask for payments and blood debts, like a feud and collect what was owed. Because of these complex relationships, villages were treated like big, special groups in the eyes of the law. They were like modern companies. But here's the important difference. Villages had more power. If someone didn't follow through with their promises, the village could use physical force, unlike regular people who couldn't back up their claims with force the same way. In the Lele community, something interesting happens with debts and rules. The ordinary men there couldn't force others to follow strict rules or commands in a systematic way. There was not a strong authority, like a government or court, to keep people in line or use force if needed. This made pawnship, which is like a debt system, pretty harmless. Even though there were rules, they were flexible and depended on people's feelings and opinions. It was important to be kind and friendly because people usually tried to avoid conflicts. Jealousy could cause tempers to flare, but fights were rare. If a disagreement did happen, the community came together to stop it and solve things peacefully through group discussion. So, the lack of a strong enforcing system made the people more focused on harmony and communication. In villages, things were a bit different. These places were like fortified places, with groups of people called age sets who could work together in times of danger. When there was conflict, it often happened because of things like women. People Douglas talked to couldn't believe grown men would fight over anything else. 
In these village situations, real wars could develop if two groups didn't agree on something important, like who a girl belonged to. If one village's leaders didn't agree with a claim, young men from that village might organize a group to take the girl away, sort of like stealing her. This could lead to serious fights, where people might get hurt or even die. When this violence happened, the village would be more firm in their demands and not be as easy to please. This is when we start to see a big divide between how much life is worth, the value that a person's life holds, and money. It's a wall that starts to crumble when acts of violence, like battles, are involved. In these times of conflict, people's lives and money become intertwined, sometimes altering the way they value and treat each other. Imagine two groups of people fighting over who gets to get something valuable that they think they should have because it's rightfully theirs, like a toy that belongs to the other group. They might feel like they can't fight each other directly because there isn't a system to make them follow the rules. In this situation, if one person from the first group can't get what they want, they might decide to pay instead. They would sell their case, which is their right to the thing, to a bigger group, like a village. The village would give money, maybe using their own savings or getting a loan, to buy the person's claim. Once the village has the money, they take over the situation. Now, they're responsible for getting that valuable thing they bought, so they plan a surprise group visit to take it away from the other group which is called a raid. This way, even though there wasn't a clear authority or force to help, the village stepped in and used their power, with the money they paid, to solve the dispute. In the Tiv culture, there's an important rule. People can't really exchange other people for anything else, like a toy or a basket. This is because human lives are considered valuable and should only be given in return for another human life. But then, something unusual happened when violence and force came into play. During wars, people captured from other communities were sometimes turned into slaves, called flesh debt. This means that they were treated as if they were a debt that had to be paid, like when you owe someone a toy, but in this case, it was a person instead of a toy. One slave could be worth, say, a hundred cloths or the same amount of a special wood called camwood. Slaves, though not numerous, were powerful reminders that human lives could have a price. When this practice was allowed, it broke the rule that a life equals only another life. Instead, it started a new equation where life had a numerical value, but it all happened because of violence. After the practice was stopped, people still remembered the change, showing how even a single event like war could redefine how we think about value and debt. I've talked a lot about the Lele people because it helps explain what I mean when I talk about a human economy. In this culture, their way of life is all about the exchange of things that are more than just money. It's like a web of social interactions where every visit, every promise, and every important moment in someone's life is marked by the use of these special items, which we call Lele currencies. These currencies are really about relationships and respect. For example, they used raffia cloth, which was used not just for covering their bodies but also for dressing up to look good and present themselves as grown-ups, respectful, and appealing to others. They also used camwood bars, which were used as makeup. Men and women alike would use it to enhance their appearance and feel dignified. So, these objects were more than just material things. They were the tools that helped create a person's identity within the community turning a basic human being into a full-fledged member of society. In short, they were a big part of how people were shaped by their social interactions and the value they placed on themselves and others. Isn't it interesting? Money often starts with things that people wear or use to look nice, like beads or shiny things like gold and silver. These things don't really do anything useful except improve how people look. Even the brass rods the Tiv used had a similar purpose they were made into jewelry or used in dances. Normal everyday money, like coins or grains, comes later, usually when governments and markets are more established. Examples like barley, cheese, tobacco, or salt got used as currencies because they could be traded. When it comes to big life events, like taking or giving someone's life, many cultures treat it very seriously. In some places, this idea that a life is priceless is like a rule. But other times, they turn it into a type of debt, 
like Tiv who think giving or taking lives means they owe something. This thought leads to complex social situations where powerful people end up trading women or rights connected to having children. So, you see, the way we think about value and debt in human societies is unique and evolves as societies change and grow.